behavior analysis is becoming very successful in a number of areas, including education, um, developmental disabilities, and it has been successful in the environment and behavioral toxicology and environmental health sciences. As we become successful, we're being asked to justify our contributions um, empirically, quantitatively. Um, and one of the challenges that we're meeting as Lane in in, in doing so, while preserving our interest in um, including data about the behavior of individual animals. Well, behavioral toxicology has a long history of doing this, and it's an area called risk assessment. And Bob and Fail has been one of the major contributors to this area. Um, and so I'm especially pleased to welcome him today at the this invited squad tutorial. Before I talk a little bit about Bob, just a word about the um, picture that's up here, which you can't see, is the quote at the bottom that says, none love, um, um, some, none love the bring, bringer of bad news. And as you can see, there's some poor soul down at the bottom that's being beat to death, um, having brought um, very bad news of the color force of the philosophical. A number of years ago, Bob and I were wondering why more people attended behavioral pharmacology than behavioral toxicology society meetings when obviously BTS was much more interesting. Um, and he pointed out that pharmacologists bring good news um, um, about drugs and that do good things, and toxicologists bring bad news. Well, Bob is going to be, um, Bob, a word about Bob, and then we'll return to that in just a moment. Bob trained at the University of Maryland as a fellow, uh, went from there to a postdoc with Lou Seiden at um, um, University of Chicago, did a brief stint at the National Center for Toxicological Research in uh, Arkansas, and then went to uh, National Health and Environmental Exposure Research Laboratories in um, Research Triangle Park uh, of the um, um, a branch of the EPA, not the park, but the labs, and um, where he spent the rest of his career. He has over 100 public, um, well over 100 publications, peer-reviewed publications, as well as book chapters. He served on numerous panels. He was branch chief at the EPA laboratories, acting um, division director at one time. He has appointments at N um, NC State, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and Bowman Grade Medical School. Um, on top of that, he's just been a terrific colleague and a terrific friend. Um, so Bob's contributions have been in making more nuanced judgments about risk assessments. And perhaps as our information that we communicate about risk assessments become more nuanced, maybe the beating will become more nuanced as well. Um, so let me get the screen up here, and while I'm doing this, let's welcome uh, Thank you. Robert Taylor. While Chris is getting that up and going, I just want to say how pleased I am to be here, and I want to thank Bill for inviting me to give this presentation. I truly consider this an honor, uh, uh, a wonderful honor in my career. Um, uh, and while Chris is doing that, you mentioned Sophocles, and later I'll be talking about aging and uh, exposure to environmental pollutants. One of my favorite quotes of Sophocles is the following of... Uh, Happiness, the crown and chiefest part is, of is wisdom, and to hold the gods in awe. This is the law that, seen the stricken heart of pride brought down, we learn when we are old. I'm at. So, there we go. Um, and apparently I can't see this on the screen, uh, so I'm going to stand out here and uh, try and remember what I have in order. Um, first of all, after thanking everybody. Uh, by way of background, I want to well, outline, I want to cover some background information, discuss the uh, scope of the problem that we're dealing with, the application of some principles, a couple of principles that I hold near and dear, uh, derived from the experimental analysis behavior, and then talk about how we can apply those uh, principles in assessing effects, then assessing risks, and talk about some future directions. My title is, and there are three, it's a three-term uh, uh, title, uh, Environment, Behavior, and Pollution. But uh, environments, uh, as you well know, there's an external environment and there's an internal environment. Our uh, uh, people in this, uh, uh, at this meeting are frequently uh, enamored with the external environment as an uh, explanation, a determinant of behavior. People in the medical uh, community is more, are 
are more enamored with the internal environment as a determinant of behavior. I personally like the tension between them, and that's where it's a fun type position to work at. With regard to behavior, um, behavior, it's the highest form of biological organization and complexity that we know of, okay? Um, and, uh, and this is extremely important. It's also the interface between the external environment and the internal environment, okay? And in fact, it's in inescapable. Uh, the environments are inescapable. We can't escape from our external environment. You know the old conundrum about if a, a tree falls in the woods and nobody's around to hear, does it really make a sound? Behavior does not exist in isolation from the environment. By the same token, you need an internal environment for proper functioning behavior. Lastly, pollution. In a word, pollution degrades both the environment and it degrades behavior. Toxicology is viewed in uh, two different realms. In pharmacology, it's viewed as high doses, all right, or the focus is on high doses. Um, Toxicologists in the pharmaceutical setting are truly the bearers of bad tidings, okay? Um, so a new drug is uh, under uh, development through preclinical studies. It looks very promising, and then it's given to the toxicologists, and they find that it produces cleft palates or supernumerary ribs or an increase in the likelihood of tumors. It could deep-six that compound very quickly. Also, in drug abuse, uh, Search into the toxicology of uh, uh, drugs of abuse is really high dose uh, uh, toxic uh, high dose uh, toxicology, as Steve uh, uh, Fowler just uh, pointed out, with amphetamine given at five milligrams per kilogram and higher. Um, in environmental science, on the other hand. Toxicology focuses on low doses, and we could go in and spend a lot of time discussing about this, but with regard to drugs, we take drugs. We take them for a reason, okay? It's under, if you will, our control. With regard to environmental science, the drugs, if you will, that we're exposed to, the chemicals we're exposed to, we have no uh, uh, option of avoiding those exposures. So and uh, toxicology and environmental science deals primarily with public health issues and also ecological issues. And of course, these are inextricably uh, uh, interrelated. A good example is, drug, well, example is drug pollutant interactions. There's great concern that people take medications and to the extent that there are environmental pollutants that act through similar mechanisms action, then people could be overwhelmed. Um, meth labs uh, in national parks and on public lands, the caustic chemicals involved in producing methamphetamine are polluting our environments, they're polluting our ecosystem, including our streams and other waters. And uh, what's down uh, even further below is uh, pharmaceuticals in the environment. This is something that's getting extremely interesting. Uh, I remember uh, about 25 years ago reading a report that um, in Stockholm uh, in late morning uh, theophylline and caffeine start showing up in the water system. Um, people uh, are taking drugs, okay, they pass through your system, they go down the toilet, they go into the water uh, system, they go to the uh, uh, water treatment plant. Some of these are discharged into lakes and streams and what have you. Uh, there are recognizable levels of pharmaceutical uh, in lakes and streams. Some of them are coming back through our tap water as well. Um, so we couldn't get that up any higher. Huh? Okay. Um, here's another way of looking at the domain of toxicology. And here I'm taking great liberties. Not so much in this dimension, but I'm dividing uh, or distinguishing between humans and other animals. Here's where I'm taking great liberties. I'm distinguishing between field studies and laboratory studies. And there's not always a hard and fast uh, dividing line between them. But in the laboratory, we have much more control over our variables, so we can establish more conclusively cause-effect relationships than we can in the field that involves all the natural vagaries and the uh, variables over which we have very little control, sometimes even understanding. Field studies in toxicology with humans is the domain or is the field of uh, epidemiology. Um, humans brought into the laboratory is the field of clinical studies under appropriate circumstances with known exposures in humans. We can bring them into the laboratory, carry out functional studies on them, determine to what extent there's 
the relationship between functional deficits and uh, their exposure in the field. Under certain circumstances, we can uh, expose uh, volunteers in the laboratory to uh, some drugs of abuse, sometimes some environmental pollutants, and determine directly what effects they have. The field equivalent of, of, of epidemiology for other animals is ecology. Okay? And uh, then laboratory studies carried out with other animals is a, a domain of uh, uh, animal models. And there are animal models uh, for not only human health uh, issues, but as well as ecological health issues. So just something to keep in mind. And of course, an interesting uh, 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 relationship here is between uh, animals in the environment, other animals in the environment, and what they can tell us about health uh, hazards for uh, human beings as well in the field. The scope of the problem is shown here. Uh, excuse me, there are literally thousands of chemicals in the environment, literally thousands. In our bodies, there are hundreds. Okay? Each of us has over 200 chemicals in our bodies that are detectable. Okay? It's just the case. Um, remarkably few of these chemicals have ever been evaluated thoroughly for their toxic potential. And that raises the issue of potential toxic effects for uh, uh, people and other uh, types of animals. And this is just a slide uh, schematic taken from a publication by Philippe Grandjean and uh, Phil Landrigan showing the chemical universe of about 80,000 chemicals. Of those, about 1,000 through the literature are known to be neurotoxic. Of those, about 200 are known to be or suspected to be neurotoxic in people, okay? and of those, five have been conclusively been shown to be developmentally neurotoxic uh, to children, as you can imagine, includes lead and polychlorinated biphenyls um, and arsenic, among other compounds. So, so many compounds out there, we know so little about them. What do we know about poisoning episodes? Uh, and and then whenever anybody gives a talk like this, they always have a section that I would call my favorite poisoning disasters. Uh, and, uh, and I will uh, offer some of mine very quickly. One is ginger jake disease. I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but uh, um, uh, ginger jake came about during prohibition. Okay, the wisdom of Congress was such that it said alcohol is bad, we need to ban it. We outlawed it, right? Well, speakeasies crept up, you know, and dis uh, stills and what have you. There was a concoction called Jamaican ginger that contained about 70% alcohol. It was freely available in any uh, drugstore. Okay? People went to the drugstore and they drank it. Okay? In one batch, originating from Boston for still unknown reasons, but there are a lot of suspicions. It was contaminated with a compound called TOCP, triorthocresyl phosphate. It's an organophosphate. In a sense, it's closely related to a nerve agent. What it did was produce or what's called organophosphate-induced delayed neuropathy. Um, after uh, people would get sick from it, after about two to three weeks, they'd start having numbness and tingling in their extremities. Soon they couldn't hold their wrists up. Uh, they would have uh, what the neurologists call wrist drop or foot drop. They'd uh, stumble going upstairs. That's because of the long neurons that innervate the extremities, and they were selectively vulnerable to this. This was a massive poisoning episode. Official records in this country were uh, 20,000 people were affected. Unofficial records are up to 60,000. I've even seen figures of 100,000. It was so well known that it was described in both literature and in song. And this is taken from John Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath, where he said then he would drink of some crave food or eat of some crave food until he was sick. He would drink Jake or whiskey until he was shaken paralytic with red, wet eyes. Um, there is an album of folk tunes out about the Ginger Jake poisoning episode. And this is just uh, lines from a couple of the tunes uh, from the Allen Brothers. They sing, I can't eat, I can't talk, been drinking mean Jake Lord, now I can't walk. You can almost hear the cadence. Um, uh, Will boy, uh, Willie Poor Boy Loftus uh, sang, uh, uh, put a tune together called Jake Lake Blues and said, Mama cried out and said, oh Lord, there's nothing in the world. Poor 
poor daddy can do because he done drank so much Jake. He's got the limber leg too. The limber leg, of course, refers to impotence uh, because of the long uh, neurons that uh, innervate uh, the penis. Uh, another case, which I'll go over very quickly, is Minamata disease, which you might be familiar with, and methylmercury. Um, a plant in, uh, uh, on the borders of Minamata Bay in Japan discharged industrial mercury into the bay. That mercury settled in the sediments. It underwent a methylation reaction, very common because of the biota. The methyl mercury was bioaccumulated in fish. Residents ate the fish, okay, including some cats. Um, and, uh, uh, and what happened were gross deformities and mental retardation in the offspring of moms that ate methyl mercury contaminated fish. This is an iconic picture uh, taken from an album of uh, photographs uh, describing the Minamata uh, Bay um, and methylmercury poisoning disaster. And here, mom is uh, caring for her child, an older child, and you can see the gross deformities in the face and in the extremities. And there, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, I mentioned cats, okay? And I mentioned earlier about cats are animals being sentinels for human health hazards. Um, it took me a while to trace this down. There's something called the dancing cat syndrome associated with methylmercury. And uh, Curlin uh, was, uh, provided a definitive account of the methylmercury in the Minamata Bay poisoning episode. In it, they said, a commonly observed syndrome in cats include unsteadiness, frequent falls, circling movements, and convulsions. Some cats became agitated, running into the bay and drowning. Okay? And they went on to, went on to describe birds uh, being affected, uh, and uh, pigs, and uh, even a, a dog, uh, similarly. There are many other poisoning episodes. You might know about Parkinson's disease that is uh, uh, contracted by uh, Chilean miners that are exposed to manganese dust. Off in the island of Guam, there is a peculiar neurological syndrome involving aspects of uh, ALS, a lateral-trophic, myotrophic lateral sclerosis, excuse me, Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. It's related to subsistence eating um, of a, a, a root that contains excitatory amino acids, including uh, beta-methylamino alanine. That's beginning to appear in brains and autopsy samples from people with ALS less in Canada and the United States and with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and then there's the amnestic shellfish poisoning episode, first in Prince uh, up in uh, 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 the Maritime Provinces. Now it's all along the West Coast, a problem, especially up in the uh, Northwest, of uh, uh, mussels contaminated with what's uh, called domoic acid. Domoic acid goes directly for the hippocampus, okay? In uh, every species tested so far, it produces seizures in high doses and, uh, per and sometimes permanent short term memory loss in, uh, at lower doses. It's also affected the flying behavior, the behavioral repertoire of pelicans and sea lions. You wouldn't want to mess with a sea lion that has been intoxicated with domoic acid. And in fact, there was a poisoning episode in the San Jose area years ago where uh, birds were flying around erratically, dive bombing people, crashing into cars, and it was uh, uh, rumored that it was uh, impetus for Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds. So. Um, from these and many other poisoning episodes, we know that the behavioral signs of intoxication include uh, sensory deficits, motor deficits, and what we'll call integrative deficits. A uh, popular term is cognitive deficits, and I'm just not keen about that term, but deficits in learning memory performance and attention. Now, uh, in assessing behavioral effects, um, Two principles are derived from the experimental analysis behavior that are extremely important. One is the importance of baselines, baselines of behavior. The other is the focus on the individual, <clears throat> as Chris mentioned earlier. I must apologize, but not entirely, uh, based upon the previous talk and talks that I've heard here already. Um, the studies that I'm going to describe to you uh, deal with motor activity, okay? Uh, and uh, the majority of them deal with motor activity. The advantages of working with motor activity, okay? Number one, is widely used in a whole lot of ologies, experimental psychology and genetics, neurobiology, pharmacology, toxicology, right? Widely used. It's readily available. 
in other words, little training is needed in order to be able to measure motor activity. And I put readily in quotes because that can be a real problem. It's so readily available that people that don't know much about behavior will begin to undertake these studies and frequently create disasters uh, that get published. Um, uh, <clears throat> The, given that there's little training required, you can test large numbers of animals. Um, sometimes it's called spontaneous activity, still in the literature. And a caveat that I offer that is really words of inspiration is from a 1951 article by uh, Carmichael, where he said, behavior is called spontaneous when it is not easily traceable to specific stimulation. That is, it's a name for ignorance. Okay. Um, the importance of baselines, uh, summarized real quickly, is redu and uh, folk, uh, individual uh, baselines for individuals is a reduced variance. This is a complicated table. Uh, the idea was very simple, but what we did was have three ages of rat. We tested them repeatedly in our activity chambers, okay? And um, for each rat, we could measure activity across repeated sessions and determine that rat's mean activity level, a standard deviation, the coefficient of variation. And then we could average across rats and get an average within subject coefficient of variation. Then on each of those sessions for each age, we could calculate a group mean average activity and a standard deviation, a coefficient of variation, then average those across sessions and get a mean uh, with, uh, between subject coefficient of variation. Okay? And so here in the far right uh, uh, column is the ratio of between subject coefficient of variation to within subject coefficient of variation. You see all the numbers are greater than one. Okay? And they increase uh, with age. So in other words, you know, using each animal as his own control reduces the variance, right? And so it's a, a just a, something you all know, and therefore what I'm going to present from now on is any uh, chemical effects will be expressed relative to individual animals' baselines. Um, Regarding assessing risk, it's an important lesson that risk is formally defined as a joint function of the hazard effects that a chemical produces and the likelihood of exposure. Okay? So you could imagine you might have a highly hazardous chemical, but if the likelihood of exposure is exceedingly low, the risk is going to be pretty low. Right? On the other hand, there may be a chemical that's not terribly hazardous, but the exposure potential for the population may be extremely high, and so therefore the risk may be uh, very high. It's derived, the term is derived from the Italian risicare, meaning to uh, dare. And just as an aside, if you haven't read it, uh, Peter Bernstein published a book, uh, 1996, I believe it is, entitled Against the Gods. Um, it's a wonderful treatment of risk assessment and mainly risk management. He traces the history of numbers, of gambling. We heard a lot about gambling over the past uh, two days, and probability and statistics. An uh, excellent book. Uh, uh, I recommend you read it. Um, inevitably, risk implies something bad. We never talk about the risk of something good. Okay, it's always the risk of something bad. And of course, risk assessment focuses on not of course, but it focuses on dose-response relationships and on sources of variability. It's a, the current approach to risk assessment really began with two uh, well-known, uh, accomplished uh, toxicologists with Food and Drug Administration, uh, Lehman and Fitzhugh in 1954, and it was based upon another famous poisoning episode. In this case, Mass and Gill Company in 1937 produced an elixir of sulfonilamide. It's a sulfa drug, so it's an antibiotic. Uh, terrible to taste, okay? So they created an elixir. Elixirs are based upon alcohol, right? So it makes it, you know, easier, more palatable to consume. Mass and Gill was so convinced of the uh, significance and the importance of this compound that they rushed it to the market without any testing whatsoever uh, before marketing it. Within two weeks after it hit the market, over 100 people died. Actually, about 120. Right? It was due to, uh, well, they didn't use alcohol, all right? They used diethylene glycol. And you might know about diethylene ethylene glycol is also known as antifreeze. Okay? Um, it was uh, obtained by prescription. So Lehman and Fitzhugh reasoned that if they got the prescription records, they should be able to estimate the dose that people took that killed them and the dose that 
doses or doses that didn't kill them, what they found was that there was about a tenfold variation in susceptibility in people. They then did laboratory studies with rats and determined that there was about a tenfold variation in susceptibility uh, in laboratory rats. So from their work, they said uh, the intraspecies variation in sensitivity is roughly one order of magnitude. This uh, plus another factor of 10, mainly to comp uh, to, uh, uh, because of the considered opinion that people were 10 times more sensitive than rats, okay, led to what was called the 100-fold margin of safety. And Peter Barton Hutt, who was a, uh, uh, still a practicing lawyer in D.C., uh, who was the chief legal counsel for FDA when quantitative risk assessment methods for cancer were uh, uh, coming to the fore, uh, is fond of saying that it was the first operational definition of safety uh, uh, for human beings. Um, individual differences. We all know this. Uh, the audience here knows it better than many other audiences. No two people respond exactly the same to a chemical exposure. And the differences could be due to the differences in age, genetics, gender, or their health status. Health status could include current diseases, past diseases, past exposures, lifestyle as well. Um, there's a general assumption that human sensitivity varies by no more than an order of magnitude. I already mentioned that maybe two. If we have time, we'll get into that. And the question is, is this plausible? And I maintain that laboratory studies can be very beneficial in uh, speaking to the plausibility of this uh, 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 general assumption that variability in the po uh, population uh, sensitivity varies by no more than one or two orders of magnitude. In order to do that, though, first we need to consider uh, dose-response functions. Dose-response functions are the currency of the realm in pharmacology and in toxicology. It's it's important to realize that there are potentially two sources of variability in a dose response function. One, the one you're more familiar with, is variability in the effect of a fixed dose. Okay? And the left panel here is just a stylized dose response curve. Uh, we're studying behavior, so for a lot of chemicals, amphetamine being an exception, although it depends upon the dose and the time after administration, uh, behavior decreases in frequency of occurrence with increasing dose. Okay? And so that's what's represented here. Um, the effect of these doses is expressed relative to the vehicle control, so 100% of control, and these are means and some measures of uh, variance. It could be a standard error, standard deviations. And I also want to point out that the doses are uh, naturally uh, na uh, log, uh, transformed uh, natural logarithms. That becomes extremely important for avoiding negative uh, values uh, in uh, risk estimation. On the right is a uh, stylized uh, rendition of what's called the benchmark dose analysis that was developed by Kenny Crump in 1984 that is currently the popular method for uh, risk assessment or, uh, uh, or assessing dose response data in EPA and FDA, I believe, for that matter. Here, what's important is that here's the same uh, axes. We're going to consider a 10% reduction in behavioral function, right? a 10% reduction. It should be, in theory, right on the cusp of our ability to measure it directly. Okay? And there are the dose response data. What Crump did was to, and what was unique, was to uh, calculate the confidence limit about the dose response function. So if you do that and you consider you want to understand or you want to estimate the dose producing a 10% reduction in behavior, okay, or function, um, what you do then is draw a line over to the intersection of the lower confidence limit about the dose response function, drop a perpendicular, and read the dose off the x-axis, okay, and then convert to analogs. What's neat about this is that the, as the variability in the dose response function changes, this benchmark dose will change too. The greater the variability, the sooner will be an intersection here, the lower will be the benchmark dose. On the other hand, the less the variability, the later the intersection, the higher will be the benchmark dose. This is extremely important because what it does is place a premium on well-controlled studies, okay, which is almost unheard of in uh, regulatory risk assessment. Uh, it's generally appreciated that if you can do a sloppy study and pass the letter of the law, you're much better off in terms of setting, uh, you know, it's from an industrial point of view, setting exposure levels or having a regulatory agency set exposure levels than if you do an extremely well-controlled study. 
Now in contrast to that source of variability, the other one, which is not as terribly familiar, is variability in the dose producing a fixed effect. This is variability in the dose dimension in the x-axis. And here we have the same coordinates. Just imagine that there are four, oh, well, here are four dose response functions, say for four precious monkeys, okay? For each of those monkeys, what we would do is calculate uh, the best fitting straight line for that animal's data. From the parameters, we'd estimate the dose producing a 10% reduction in behavior. Right? With sufficient replications, we could then establish a distribution of ED10s. With that distribution, then what we can do is say, all right, it, um, uh, for a uh, 1 in 10 likelihood of a 10% or a 10% decrease in 1 in 10 subjects, this would be the dose associated with that effect. We could say, well, what about the dose associated with 1 in 100 subjects, 1 in 1,000, 1 in 10,000? We'd be moving out into the tail of this distribution, getting to lower and lower doses. When I first came across this, I found it remarkably complicated. Uh, and to tell you the truth, I was flying to uh, uh, California um, uh, on an overnight flight uh, for a FASA meeting, and I had uh, 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 Peter Dews's publication, and it had an, uh, uh, an appendix to it. And I calculated data, I made up data, and by the time I got to Los Angeles, I understood it. And it was remarkably simple, and I told them later that this was an ingenious approach uh, to uh, uh, estimating uh, uh, probabilities of risks. And he said, look, you know, I said, how did you come up with it? And he said, well, you know the work of Treven, don't you? Uh, John Treven was the head of pharmacology at uh, Wellcome Research Laboratories in England. Uh, he introduced the LD50 test, the uh, Median Lethal Dose 50 test, which you may be familiar with. In those days, there were so many concoctions prepared, like uh, batches of insulin, uh, toxins derived from plants. There needed to be some biological standards what Treven did was invent the LD50. So new batches of, say, insulin could be standardized with regard to potency in terms of its LD50. Right? And these data represent, are taken from this paper in 1927. These are actually data on the reproducibility of LD50 values uh, for cocaine. Um, uh, studies carried out over a period of about two years. All that I want you to do is look at this line right here. I think it's between D and E. Um, and that is the confidence limit on the dose of cocaine likely to produce a 10, uh, 50 percent, uh, uh, produce 50 percent survival in, say, a group of 100 mice. I said survival for obvious reasons. We didn't want to express the Inverse. Okay. What I wanted to do now is tell you about some studies we did with carbaryl to begin with. Carbaryl is a uh, short-acting carbamate pesticide. It's a cholinesterase inhibitor. It's a kissing cousin, if you will, to physostigmine, uh, to neostigmine, to pyridostigmine. The difference is pyridostigmine and neostigmine are cholinesterase inhibitors in the peripheral nervous system and in the neuromuscular junction, not in the central nervous system. Physostigmine and carbaryl inhibit cholinesterase in both the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system. We used adult male Long Evans rats. Uh, we had four groups of nine rats. We studied their activity in that photocell device that I showed earlier during 30-minute sessions. The sessions, remember I mentioned about baselines, sessions were uh, programmed or arranged five days per week. We gave the rats one week of adaptation to the testing routine, uh, and then over the next four weeks we dosed the rats with carbaryl, either giving the vehicle, in this case corn oil, 3, 10, or 30 milligrams per kilogram. Each, uh, uh, the doses were given once a week. It's a very short-acting compound, but we said, well, let's just give it once a week to be insured, uh, to be uh, absolutely convinced that there is no lingering uh, 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 residue of the compound. Um, order of dosing depended upon group uh, assignment. In the end, every rat got every treatment, and then carbaryl effects for each rat were expressed relative to its own control, vehicle control value. And here are the data for, uh, this is the mean and standard deviation, the dose response function for carbaryl on motor activity uh, for the 36 animals. Now what we did for each animal was calculate 
formulate the best fitting straight line um, and then use the parameters to estimate the dose producing a 10% decrease in activity. And so we wound up with a distribution of 36 ED10s. Okay? Oh, I should also point out that this just shows the reproducibility of the effect of carbaryl on activity. This is group assignment. Uh, the first exposure here is would be a group defined dose response function. You can see that falls right in the middle of the other functions. So anyway, we wind up with a distribution of 36 uh, ED10s. In terms of estimating the range now of variability, what he did was this, very simply. I said that, all right, the range is encompassed by the mean ED10 for this distribution of 36 scores plus three standard deviations and the mean ED10 minus three standard deviations. Okay. When you do that, you find that the minimum dose estimated to produce a 10% reduction in activity is about a quarter of a milligram per kilogram of carbaryl. The maximum dose is just under 30 milligrams per kilogram. The ratio is 123. In other words, there's about a little over two orders of magnitude variation in sensitivity to carbaryl using this assay, okay? And I want to point out that these data are derived from young, adult, healthy, male, outbred rats. Here data taken from, I'm sorry, Jace Gloa was instrumental. There was a study that he and I carried out and published in 1995. Um, Jace uh, uh, was working uh, with Peter Dews um, and uh, where Peter developed this dose tolerance model. Jace was the one who really sort of flushed it out in many regards. And they published this study on the effects of five solvents, volatile organic solvents, on um, uh, using a cumulative dosing procedure on the uh, FI uh, 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 one minute performance of mice uh, uh, performing um, using uh, evaporated milk as a reinforcer. I did a similar analysis on their data and here are the ratios of, uh, for the solvents and you can see they're pretty high. Down here is a take home message. The individual sensitivity varied between one a quarter and three and a half orders of magnitude. Right. in young adult healthy male outbred mice. Okay. Now remember I mentioned about the possible risk factors that d d dictate or can influence sensitivity. We haven't controlled any of those or haven't really explored uh, any of those. Um, uh, in the two studies that I've just presented to you. But we already know that the sensitivity can vary by orders of magnitude. I would posit right now that age is arguably the most important factor, um, uh, risk factor, um, determining sensitivity to chemicals. It's well known and well accepted that children uh, are more at risk by virtue of exposure to environmental pollutants. Just think of lead, uh, think of methylmercury, um, uh, and of course in EPA it's extremely, uh, there's a great concern over children being inadvertently exposed to pesticide residues in fruits and vegetables because on a milligram per kilogram body weight basis, they eat a lot more than adults. Okay? Um, but a question is, what about other susceptible ages, and uh, including older adults? And why older adults, other than because I'm up here? Um, and when I look around the audience, uh, uh, the fact of the matter is the aging of uh, the population is aging. It's aging in the United States, it's aging worldwide. All right? And what do we know about aging? There's an increased likelihood of risk, uh, risk of injury and disease. This is called frailty in gerontological circles. There's an increased recovery time following injury or disease. Many of us can attest to that. This is called, uh, referred to in gerontology circles as the loss of resilience. There's greater sensitivity to drugs and pollutants. Okay? Uh, there is what's called the Beers List, uh, which is um, a periodic list of drugs, prescription drugs that are contraindicated for older adults. It's updated oh, every four or five years. There's about 200 compounds uh, on that list. And of course, uh, pollutants is a, a major concern right now. And what caught my attention about aging work was this generally accepted principle that the variability goes up with age. Okay. So, we did a study with toluene. Uh, I already showed you some toluene data from the Glow and uh, Dew's uh, publication. Uh, toluene is a volatile organic solvent. Uh, there are many volatile organic solvents. It has many actions on behavior and on the central nervous system. It's also a drug of abuse. 
uh, as are many of the volatile organic solvents. We used in these studies right, uh, male brown Norway rats. Uh, brown Norway rats, because they were available through the National Institute on Aging, they and uh, uh, Fisher 344 albino rats were available, and we just have never had a desire to work with albino rats for a whole lot of reasons. Uh, we studied their motor activity. We evaluated motor activity. We got lazy. We evaluated motor activity once weekly in these rats, and we know that if we evaluate motor activity once weekly, we can maintain a fairly stable baseline for two to three months, okay, um, uh, and uh, uh, during 30-minute sessions. Each rat received vehicle and toluene in different experiments. A range of doses of toluene was given. All I'm going to do is present the results from one dose that we zeroed in on as we got more uh, smarter about uh, toluene's effects on activity. Toluene effects were, for each rat were expressed as a percent of vehicle. So here are the data from the study. Remember, there's four ages of rat, uh, one, four, 12, and 24 months of age. These would correspond to adolescents, young adults, middle-aged adults, and senescent adults, all right, old rats. Um, these are the activity data, the baseline activity data in counts per session. And you can see that uh, activity is highest in the four-month-old animals and lower uh, in the other age groups. On the right are the effects of toluene on activity expressed relative to each animal's individual control baseline. So it's presented as percent of control, and you can see there's 100%. What this shows is that the adolescent rats weren't affected by this dose of uh, toluene. Right? For the four and 12 month old rats, they uh, displayed about a 45% increase in activity produced by this dose of toluene. And in the senescent rats, they uh, uh, it produced about a 150% increase in activity. And you can see the increase in variability too in the old rats. Now, one of the nice things uh, about statistics, one of the only nice things about statistics, uh, is, uh, I speak uh, loosely, is the normal distribution. Uh, it's been around since, uh, what, 1734, I believe. Uh, a fellow named De Mauve, uh, introduced it, and shortly after that, the standard deviation. The normal distribution, there's the equation for those uh, in the audience that are into equations. Um, uh, the normal distribution is basically the distribution of observations expressed in standard deviation units. These are converted to z-scores. Z-scores are extremely friendly statistics, okay? And we know, uh, because of this equation, that uh, the number of scores uh, encompassed by a range of uh, plus or minus one z-score is 68% of the observations. For two z-scores, it's 95%. For three, it's 99%. Nice, awfully nice feature uh, to use for risk assessment purposes. What we did was to, first of all, calculate, the, these are the data that you just saw, and now they're color-coded. Uh, we took the toluene data for the four-month-old rats. We considered those our reference group, okay? And then we expressed the toluene data for each of the other three ages as z-score equivalents using the parameters of the four-month-old rats, okay? And so the distributions are shown here. And the green line is the four-month-old uh, animals. The blue line uh, represents the distribution of uh, toluene effects, a single dose, um, uh, at uh, the 12-month-old animals. And you can see for the 24-month-old animals, there's a shift to the right in higher z-scores, bigger effect on activity, and look at the spread in activity, too. It's huge. For the uh, adolescents, they weren't affected by uh, toluene, and therefore they have negative z-scores, and you can see how sharp and uh, 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 peak that distribution is. Now again, the nice, oh, and this just summarizes uh, the z-score analysis. The reference group uh, was the four-month-old animals. They had a mean of zero and standard deviation of one. All that meant was we did the calculations correctly. Right? And uh, you can see, I'll just point down here to uh, the senescent rats, the 24-month-old rats. They had a mean of 2.2. Uh, Two, so two plus standard deviation shift in the mean effect, and the standard deviation was uh, just under three. So there's a threefold increase in variance. Now the other nice thing about uh, uh, z scores and normal distributions is uh, we can, uh, <clears throat> in terms of estimating risk, 
will just arbitrarily pick an, uh, a z-score based upon the reference group, in this case 1.65. And we know that, and that's that green area right here, we know that 5% of the observations exist in that tail, right? This is basic statistics. We can then calculate the area under the curve at that same z-value, all right, for the middle age and the old rats, okay, and that's shown there. This is my one attempt at animation. Um, and, uh, and then we can take the ratio of the areas under the curve, if you will. And when we do that, you've already seen these values, okay? Uh, for a z-score, a reference score of 1.65, meaning that there's 5% of the observations in the four-month-old animals out in that tail, all right? The increase in risk for the adolescents is zero, right? The increase in risk for the young adults is zero, because they're a reference group. The increase and risk for the middle-aged animals is 22 percent, and for the senescent rats, an increase of risk of 1,330. That is a preposterous increase in risk from an epidemiological point of view. But that's the advantage of uh, laboratory studies, where we have the liberty of moving the doses all over the place so we can look for big effects and we can also look for big uh, changes in variability uh, in those big effects as well. Um, in terms of where we're going with this, I grandiosely want to attempt to estimate variability at a population level. Okay? Um, and I should put that in quotes. A laboratory analog of the population. That would include multiple ages, say three, four, five ages, both genders, okay, um, and healthy and impaired uh, subjects. And we could talk about what an impaired subject would be. Frankly, in an aging context, it would be the ad lib fed rat. Uh, the ad lib fed rat is metabolically morbid. It's uh, just it's a, a wonderful model of multi functional disease, uh, if you will. We'd carry out this dose tolerance analysis and then look at variability using confidence limits or plus or minus three standard deviation or z-scores or what have you, and then determine how many orders of magnitude there would be in variability in this population level. With that information, we could then go back and partition the population variance into the demographics, okay? So we could determine of that range of, of sensitivity, how how much of that is due to age, how much is due to gender, how much is due to health condition. We're slowly building toward that. We started off with uh, uh, young adult rats. We're now looking at aging ra uh, rats at multiple ages. We've begun to include uh, males and females in some of our studies. Soon we'll be including uh, diseased animals, mainly ad lib fed rats versus calorically restricted rats, which everybody knows is good for everybody, every species ever tested. So the conclusions are individual differences in chemical sensitivity may be much greater than currently anticipated. Um, estimates based upon laboratory animal studies, they must be considered lower bound estimates on human va uh, variability. Why? Because there's so many other variables all right, that uh, are displayed and, and, and experienced by humans that we simply don't control or don't vary in the laboratory. So these are always going to be lower bound estimates on human variability. And I hope I've convinced you that methods are available for quantifying individual differences in in order to make informed decisions at risk and benefit for that matter. And we don't have a chance to get into that. Lastly, I want to acknowledge uh, Peter B. Dews, uh, who was an intellectual mentor of mine for uh, getting me interested in toxicology at first. Uh, he and uh, Bernie Weiss were uh, extremely instrumental in uh, me getting uh, my first real paying job in toxicology and I've stayed with it ever since. John Glow, Jace Glow is now at the NIH for lots of collaboration that continues. John Vandenberg is one of the chief risk assessors in EPA who's very quantitatively oriented and has helped it with the thinking. Ron Wisga is an equally talented biostatistician from the Electric Power Research Institute in California, who was very instrumental in shaping my thinking. And lastly, Kim Kimberly Jarema, a student, former student of Alan Polings, uh, who's been my lab technician for about 12 years, who's considerably more organized uh, uh, than I am. Um, and last, I want to say thank you for your time and effort, and remember, remember the troops. Thank you very much. Yes, Bill. Uh, I was wondering uh, what your thoughts are on, uh, uh, I guess it's thinking 
thinking about the Americans' tolerance for TSA and, and, the, and the, uh, the degree of control they have over everything the airline flights and how many people are likely to be hurt in airline problems, and then move over to methyl mercury. And it seems like there's an incredible resistance and hostility to anything the EPA says about this is not good for your health. And I've always found that strange. Like, why is it that people are against what's, what you would think is good for you? Well, um, to offer a cheeky response, admittedly cheeky, it's generally considered an EPA by the regulators that they know they're doing their job properly when everybody is ticked off with them, okay? <laughs> including industry, the chemical manufacturers, and the public. The public because we're not doing enough work, chemical industry because we're doing too much work, okay? And, and, and I must confess, I'm not involved in that in any direct way whatsoever. Um, Lead is a, probably a really good example. Lead and uh, uh, developmental uh, disabilities, or uh, uh, altered uh, development. Lead has been known to be neurotoxic since the 20s, right? Uh, yeah, so, yeah, right, so you go back to the Romans for that matter. But people, I mean, uh, in a battery manufacturing plant, there were fumes of lead. Uh, people were having hallucinations. They were being diagnosed as schizophrenic. They said that, you know, this is the crazy room uh, at the plant, all right? Um, then it became apparent that children were affected by lead. The original laboratory data, um, we talked earlier, uh, was extremely chaotic on this uh, matter, um, uh, very chaotic. Uh, for the longest time, I thought that lead was a stochastic compound, if it had any reliable effects uh, on development. As we learned, we got smarter and smarter in terms of our experimental paradigms in laboratory animals as well as in evaluating children, and we found highly reproducible effects. Small shifts, a half a standard deviation shift in IQ in kids exposed to lead, but extremely reliable effects. Now when you translate that to a population level, it spells big time uh, problems, okay? An interesting twist on that right now, and this just uh, happened, well it happened two years ago before the administrator left. If you look at a plot of uh, IQ uh, as a function of lead exposure, all right, um, it goes down super linearly at very low lead concentrations, and then it sort of has a, takes on a different slope. An international comparison study has shown that that is highly uh, reliable. Okay, so we're talking about exceedingly low levels of lead, uh, 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 levels that exist in virtually everybody in this, uh, in this country. Although things are getting better in that regard since it's been banned. Uh, but the point is, is that um, that's never been. You can't study that in the laboratory, but the point is is that uh, that took quite some time before that was accepted by the regulatory offices. But the industry is, still says, no, that's really, you know, that's all noise and you can't get down that far. One thing, you know, for, for a battery to be against uh, control of lead uh, makes sense to me. I mean, it's not good, but it's, I, I understand uh, it. But it, it seems like the people, the average person living in the average person is against against uh, uh, EPA regulations, or am I just getting a, uh, a, a, a wrong view of what people, what people support? The, um, well, you know, there's always the concern about over-regulation. You know, there's the land of the free, you know, and, uh, and of course we've got tea partiers now that are emphasizing, you know, the uh, overreach of the uh, federal government. I must say, though, that in the meetings that I've been in, uh, public meetings regarding uh, 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 tentative regulations, the industry shows up, all right? The people with a vested interest in the economics show up and talk. The public shows up, but in an exceedingly small fraction. But when you ask people, especially about kids, say, what, would you want your kid exposed to some compound that may alter that uh, uh, child's ability to learn how to read or write or do math? It's a no-brainer. Thank you very much.